Hey guys, how's it going? Hope you're doing well. My name is Crown and today I'm going to read you some very interesting stories that I hope that you're gonna love. And now, without further ado, let's go. My husband and I have been married for 13 years now. We met in college, fell in love and tied the knot soon after graduation. From the beginning, we both wanted a big family. We'd talk for hours about how many kids we'd have, what we'd name them and the kind of parents we'd be. It was our shared dream, our future. But life had other plans. Year after year, we tried to conceive. Nothing happened. At first, we thought it was just bad timing. Then we started to worry. We saw doctors, changed our diets, tried every old wife's tale and remedy we could find. Still, nothing. The disappointment each month was crushing. A cry my husband would hold me, promising we keep trying. We took breaks sometimes to let our hearts heal a bit before diving back in. It was hard on both of us, but we were in it together, or so I thought. A friend of mine suggested we try in vitro fertilization. I was hesitant at first. It's expensive and not guaranteed to work. But after thinking it over, I decided to bring it up with my husband. Hey, I've been thinking maybe we should consider trying IVF. IVF? Isn't that really expensive? It is, but we've got some savings. I think it might be worth a shot. He didn't look convinced. But he didn't say no either. I gave him some time to think about it. A few days later, I brought it up again. So what do you think about the IVF idea? I don't know, it's not guaranteed to work. We might end up spending a lot of money for nothing. I know it's not a sure thing, but we can afford to try at least once. We've got enough saved up. He looked at me for a long moment, his expression unreadable. Then he dropped a bombshell. Look, logically speaking, since you're the cause of our infertility, I think you should handle the cost of the IVF I think you should handle the cost of the IVF sessions by yourself. I felt like I'd been slapped. The words didn't make sense at first. Surely I'd misheard him. What? What do you mean? I'm not obligated to pay for your medical issues. It's your problem. So you should deal with it. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. This man, who had held me while I cried over negative pregnancy tests, who had sworn we were in this together, was now telling me I was on my own. Are you serious right now? We've been trying to have a baby together for years. And now you're saying it's just my problem? Don't get upset. I'm just being honest about how I feel. How you feel? How about how I feel? I thought we were partners in this. I was shaking with anger and hurt. Was that another word? I stormed off to our bedroom and started back in a bag. What are you doing? I'm going to stay with my mother. I can't be here right now. He didn't try to stop me. As I was leaving, he just stood there watching me go. I have expected him to apologize to say he didn't mean it, but he didn't. I drove to my mother's house in a daze. How had things gone so wrong so quickly? My phone buzzed with a text from him. Truth hurts. That's when I knew. This wasn't a momentary lapse in judgment. This was how he really felt. The next few days were a blur. My family got involved, telling me I was overreacting, that I needed to consider his feelings too. Mom tells me, you need to... You need to go back home. Your husband has a right to his feelings too. His feelings? What about mine? He basically told me our infertility is all my fault. I'm sure he didn't mean it like that. He's probably just stressed about the whole situation. No, he meant exactly what he said. He even texted me saying truth hurts. Well, you have to understand. Not being able to be a father is hard on him too. It's a basic human right, you know? I couldn't believe what I was hearing. Even my own mother was taking his side. A human right? What about my right to be treated with respect by my own husband? I ended the conversation there. I couldn't bear to hear any more excuses for his behavior. As the days passed, I did a lot of thinking. Yes, I had issues with fertility, but we'd known that for years. And he'd always said we're in it together. What changed? And more importantly, could I ever look at him the same way again? After a week, I made my decision. I went back to our house not to reconcile, but to pack up the rest of my things. You're back. Are you ready to talk? Yes, I am. I want a divorce. What? Don't you think you're overreacting? Overreacting? He told me our infertility was my problem alone. You made it clear that you don't see us as partners anymore. But, no. I've thought about this a lot. I deserve better than someone who'll abandon me when things get tough. Someone who'll throw my medical issues in my face instead of supporting me. You can't be serious. What about our family? The family we were trying to have? That dream died the moment you decided it was just my problem, not ours. I finished packing my things and headed for the door. 
As I was leaving, I turned back one last time. By the way, I made an appointment with a fertility specialist. Turns out, the issue isn't just with me. You might want to get yourself checked out. After all, it's your medical issue now. I left them standing there, mouth open in shock. As I drove away, I felt much relief. The road ahead will be hard, but for the first time in a long time, I felt hope. Hope for a future where I was valued, respected, and truly loved. Whether that included children or not. My dad's always been a quiet, no-nonsense kind of guy. He doesn't talk much, but when he does, people listen. We live on this big piece of land just outside town. It's been in our family for generations. Growing up, I watched my dad work that land every day. He taught me the value of hard work and respecting other people's property. What's ours is ours, he'd say. And what's theirs is theirs. Simple as that. Our property backs up to a beautiful lake. Dad always let the locals use our private dock for fishing, as long as they were respectful. But lately, some city folks bought the house next door, and they started treating our land like their personal playground. That's when Dad put up the sign. Big red letters. Private property. No trespassing. He thought that would be the end of it, but boy was he wrong. It all started on a Saturday morning. I was helping Dad fix up the old tractor when we heard a commotion down by the lake. We walked over to check it out and that's when I first laid eyes on her. The woman who became the bane of our existence. She was standing there in designer clothes looking like she'd just dipped out of a fashion magazine. But the look on her face was anything but pretty. What's the meaning of this sign? You can't just block access to the lake. Man, this is private property. The sign is pretty clear. Do you know who I am? I'm friends with the mayor. He can't do this. Dad tells her, doesn't matter who you are, this land belongs to my family. You're welcome to use a public beach down the road. This is ridiculous. I'm not leaving. And just like that, she stormed off towards the lake, completely ignoring the sign. Dad just shook his head and we went back to work. I thought that would be the end of it, but I was so wrong. The next day, we found the sign knocked over. Dad put it back without a word. But the day after that, it was knocked over again. This went on for a week straight. Every morning, we'd find the sign on the ground and every morning, Dad would put it back up. Finally, on the eighth day, we caught her in the act. We were down by the lake early, fixing up the dock when we heard a car pull up. It was her, of course. She marched right up to the sign, looked us dead in the eye, kicked it over. Then she smiled like she just won some kind of victory. Oops, how clumsy of me. Ma'am, I'm only going to say this once. This is private property. You're trespassing. Please leave. Or what? He'll call the police? Go ahead. My husband's a lawyer. We'll sue you for restricting lake access. The lake isn't ours, but this land is. Last warning. Oh, stuff it, old man. And then right in front of us, she grabbed the sign and snapped it in half over her knee. I've never seen anyone act so entitled in my life. I looked at my dad, expecting him to explode. But he just stood there calm as he could be. All right, you've made your point. Have a nice day. The woman looked confused for a second, then smirked and sauntered off towards the lake. I couldn't believe it. Dad, are you really just gonna let her get away with that? Son, there is a saying. Revenge is a dish best served cold. Just wait. For the next week, everything was quiet. No sign, no confrontations. And I almost thought Dad had given up. But then, early one Saturday morning, he woke me up with a gleam in his eyes. Time to go fishing, son. Now, we hadn't been fishing together in years, but I knew better than to question him. We loaded up the truck and headed out to the lake. But instead of going to our usual spot, Dad drove to the public beach. We spent the whole day there casting our lines and enjoying the sun. As evening rolled around, Dad checked his watch and smiled. Time to head home. When we got back, I couldn't believe my eyes. Our entire property line from the road all the way down to the lake was lined with brand new signs, big metal ones, cemented into the ground. Each one read, private property, 24-hour video surveillance in effect, trespassers will be prosecuted. And there, right in the middle of it all, was a woman. She was red-faced and screaming at a police officer, who looked like he'd rather be anywhere else. This is harassment. He can't do this. Ma'am, he's within his rights. This is private property. But we had an agreement. He said I could use a lake. Dad, walking up, I never said any such thing. Officer, I'd like to press charges for trespassing and destruction of property. The woman's face went pale. 
She started sputtering excuses, but the officer just shook his head. Ma'am, please turn around. You're under arrest. As they led her away, Dad turned to me with a wink. Sometimes, son, you've got to let people dig their own holes. Then you just sit back and watch them try to climb out. As for the woman last I heard, she was doing community service, cleaning up litter at the public beach. Seems fitting, doesn't it? Sometimes karma has a way of working things out. All on its own. I'm a 72-year-old woman who's been working as a cashier at a big home improvement store for the past 7 years. I've always loved my job, you know? The smell of fresh lumber and the excitement of helping people with their DIY projects and the satisfaction of being named Cashier of the Year in 2021. It was all going great until that day when everything changed. It was a quiet afternoon in July and I was working alone in the garden center. The sun was beating down making the air inside the greenhouse thick and humid. I was just about to take a sip of water when this guy approached my register. He looked ordinary enough, but something about him made me uneasy. He put a bunch of expensive items on a counter and pulled out a card. Now, I've seen all sorts of cards in my time, but this one was weird. It had instructions written on the back telling me to process it as cash. Red flags were going up in my head, but I didn't know what to do. Sir, I'm not sure I can process this card as cash. Let me call my supervisor. No need for that. Just run it through. It's a special company card. I hesitated, my finger hovering over the call button. But then I remembered what happened just three months ago at another store in our chain. A last prevention officer had been shot and killed trying to stop a theft. The memory of that tragedy made my blood run cold. Uh, I suppose I can try. My hands were shaking as I ran the transaction. It went through for over $1,300 and the guy grabbed his stuff and left. And I breathed a sigh of relief, but my relief was short-lived. About half an hour later, he was back. My heart sank. I knew he was targeting me because I was alone. Hey there, remember me? I need to make another purchase. I tried to call my supervisor again, but no one answered. The guy was getting impatient. Come on, hurry up. I don't have all day. I'm sorry, sir, but I really need to speak with my manager about this. Listen, lady. Just do the transaction like before. What's the problem? His tone was getting aggressive, and I felt scared. I looked around, but there was no one else in sight. My mind raced back to our annual training sessions, where they told us what to do in case of shoplifting or worse. Don't approach, don't touch, don't try to dissuade, to interfere, just let them go. The instructor's voice echoed in my head. With shaken hands, I processed three more transactions, all over $4,000 in total. As soon as he left, I made copies of all the receipts and took them to my manager. I thought I was doing the right thing by reporting it. Four days later, I was called into the office. Manager says, I'm sorry, but we have to let you go. You've created a security risk by processing these fraudulent transactions. But I tried to call for help. I was scared. Don't you remember what happened to that poor man in Pleasanton? I understand, but rules are rules. We can't have employees who can't follow our security protocols. Just like that, seven years of dedicated service meant nothing. I was devastated. I had never been fired before in my life. At 72, I found myself suddenly without a job, without health care, and struggling to pay rent. But here is a kicker. Just six months before this incident, I had discovered that a teenage new hire was making more money than me. Can you believe it? This kid, fresh out of high school, was earning $21 an hour, while I, with seven years of experience, was only making 20.17. I complained and they gave me a $2 raise. But looking back, I think that put a target on my back. It took me a while, but I eventually found a new part-time job. It's not the same, though. I miss my old workplace, my regular customers, the sense of purpose it gave me. But more than that, I'm angry. Angry at how disposable they made me feel after years of loyal service. Angry at how they expected me to risk my safety for their merchandise. So now I'm fighting back. I've hired a lawyer and we're suing them for age discrimination and wrongful termination. It's not about the money, really. It's about dignity. It's about standing up for what's right. All I know is I'm not going down without a fight. This old cashier still has some fire left in her. I never had the kind of dad you see in movies or TV shows. You know, the ones who teach their kids how to ride a bike or cheer from the sidelines at Little League games. Nah, my old man was always off in his own world. He's a jazz musician, always chasing the next gig or composing his latest masterpiece. Don't get me wrong, he wasn't mean or anything, just absent. 
Growing up, it was mostly just me and mom. She did her best to fill both roles, but there was always something missing. I'd watch other kids with their dad and feel this weird mix of jealousy and confusion. Why couldn't my dad be like that? As I got older, I started to notice the cracks in my parents' relationship. The hushed arguments, the cold silences, the way mom would sometimes cry when she thought I couldn't hear. But hey, that's just how marriage is sometimes, right? At least, that's what I told myself. Then came the day that changed everything. I was 18, fresh out of high school and trying to figure out what to do with my life. It was a regular Tuesday morning, mom was making coffee and I was carving down some cereal before heading out to my summer job. The doorbell rang, mom answered it, probably thinking it was just another Amazon delivery. But when she came back into the kitchen, her face was white as a sheet. In her trembling hands were a stack of papers. He, he filed for a divorce. What? Who? Your father. These are divorce papers. It felt like the floor had dropped out from under me. Divorce? But they hadn't even been fighting lately. Hell, Dad had been home more in the past few weeks than he had in years. It didn't make sense. But then the truth came out, and it was worse than I could have imagined. Not only had Dad been cheating on Mom, but he'd been doing it for years with multiple women. And the kicker? He'd already filed for divorce weeks ago and hadn't bothered to tell Mom. He let her find out from some random delivery guy, dropping off legal paperwork. The next few months were a blur of tears, shouting matches, and awkward silences. Mom was a wreck, and I was caught in the middle trying to hold everything together. Eventually, the divorce was finalized, and we all tried to move on. Dad didn't waste any time. Within a year, he was married to one of the singers he'd been cheating with. I tried to be civil for the sake of the family peace, but every time I saw them together, I felt this burning anger in my gut. Then about a year ago, they had a baby. My little half-brother. Despite everything, I couldn't tell but love the little guy. He was innocent in all this mess. After all, I started visiting more often, partly to see him and partly to keep an eye on how dad was doing as a parent this time around. During these visits, I noticed something was interesting. My little bro was obsessed with noise. Any toy he could bang, shake, or rattle, he was all over it. The louder, the better. And that's when I had an idea. A pretty childish but oh so satisfying idea. His first birthday was coming up and I knew exactly what to get him. A marching drum. Big, loud, and impossible to ignore. I could already imagine Dad's face when he opened it. The day of the party arrived and I showed up with my oversized, brightly wrapped gift. Dad's new wife answered the door. Oh, you didn't have to bring such a big present. Me, smiling innocently. It's his first birthday. I wanted it to be special. I made my way to the living room where Dad was sitting up for the party. He looked up when I walked in, his eyes widening at the size of the gift. That's, uh, quite a package you've got there. Nothing but the best for my little bro. The party went on, with relatives and friends cooing over the baby and making small talk. Fine. Finally, it was time for presents. I made sure mine was last. All right, buddy, let's see what your big sister got you. He held the baby tear out of the wrapping paper, revealing the shiny new drum. For a moment, there was silence. Then my brother's face lit up. He reached for the drum, giggling with delight. New wife says, Oh, how nice. Her smile looked a bit forced. Dad, looking at me with a mix of disbelief and dawn and realization, You didn't. Me grinning, What? He loves noisy toys. My little brother was already banging away on a drum, creating a cacophony that filled the entire house. I could see Dad and his wife wincing with each beat. Dad leaning in to whisper to me, Was this really necessary? Me shrugging, just thought he'd like it. It's love music, right? Must run in the family. The rest of the party was a symphony of chaos. My brother refused to let go of the drum, much to everyone's barely concealed annoyance. As I was leaving, I overheard dad and his wife talking in hushed tones. Wife says, we can't keep that thing in the house. It's too loud. I know, I know. We'll figure something out. Seeing dad squirm a bit felt pretty good. Maybe now he'd get a taste of what it's like to not be able to escape your responsibilities. And now we have reached the end of today's stories. Thank you for watching and see you next time.